Hi, everybody. Will here with this week's interview chair. This week, we have a very special guest, the ex-president of the Irish Kennel Club, Mr. Sean Delmar, renowned judge, renowned Carrie Blue Terrier breeder, a wealth of information on any topic you want to talk about. So sit back and enjoy Sean for the next hour or so. Hi, everybody. Will here with this week's interview chair. We have a special guest this week. We have Sean Delmar, the ex-president of the Irish Kennel Club, renowned breeder of Care Blue Terriers and Smooth Fox Terriers. How are you, Sean? I'm good, thank you. Thank you for having me on, Will. Well, it's good to see you. I haven't seen you for a while. You were here last year, but I didn't go to that show. I think you were in Orangeville, I think. Was it Orangeville? We were, uh, no, we weren't in U.S. Uh, last year. But uh, listen, we've been over. U.S. is kind of a great hub for um, for pedigree dogs, and it's always a pleasure to go over there. And but wait, weren't you in Canada last year? No, no. Well, oh, maybe it was the year before. I'm thinking then. The year yeah, before probably. Yeah, yeah. Because I I saw you probably I don't know five or six years ago at the Hamilton Dog Show. Yeah, that's yeah, right. Yeah. That. We talked. We sat and talked. I sat and watched. Carrie Blue Terriers with you actually while well, your wife was judging. So right, yeah. Listen, um, the level of uh, presentation and uh, particularly in my opinion of, of terriers is very very high in in the in the, in the states, and uh, it's always a pleasure. You always get quality dogs presented at the right level, and I think you, you have a good idea of type. I, th I think you genuinely feel like you like the whole type, and that's important. You can easily get lost between presentation and performance, and in the middle of all that, which is very nice for the best in show in the group, oh, for sure. but you can yeah. actually lose type. But I think you guys, you seem to come back to type. <laughs> <laughs> try to most cases right yeah well. i'm gonna i'm gonna start here i want to the first question i want to ask you sean is how did you get involved in the sport of dogs and how old were well, you well it's actually it's a family hobby it's, it's kind of nearly like royal secession my father and uh, mother were both involved very heavily in breeding and exhibiting uh dogs as was my uncle and aunt so i had a big kind of extended family who were all involved in the pedigree dog um game what and breed did your parents young, breed so, sorry what breed did your parents breed uh, my father started with German Shepherds, but he had no luck. It was kind of in the late 40s, early 50s, and he had no real luck with uh, the German Shepherds. A very promising dog he had got some, one of those diseases that no longer exist now. But uh, And he just had no luck, and he tried to breed. So my uncle suggested that he go in to get a Kerry Blue, and this is kind of something. And that's what happened. So he got a, a Kerry Blue, and it started from there. And it carried on with you. Yeah, we um, from the time I was a child, then we were going to the shows, right into the back of the car, off to the show, and um, know your role, give a hand with the boxes, like the you say, like apprentice handler, uh, get the dogs out, brush them up. The father would be there, the family would be running around, uh, and in those days in Ireland, it was a very social occasion as well. Uh, the dictation, the venue, if the bar was good in the venue, it got a good entry because. <laughs> Generally, people, uh, after they'd finished, uh, you know, exhibiting, and uh, they would go to the bar and uh, dissect the judge or the opinions and, and wake the corpse, for want of a better word. They would get all that little angst and disappointment out of the way over a couple of points, and then the, the slate would be cleared, and then we could start again at the next show. It's not like Facebook now, I'm afraid. True, true. So when did you, how old were you when you started the dog shows then? 
Well, I started being given the second or third string dogs to show down at the, at the end. That's the way I started, really. And just on an aside there, seeing that we're talking about um, to you guys in the States, uh, our, our first dog we sent to America in 1954, my father's uh, Kerry Blue, named Shalala Fiery Charm, and became a, she won a UK title, Irish title, and also um, in the States she became, I, I'm not, I didn't follow her career properly, but she definitely Definitely made her title in the states and was shown in the states around the 1954-55 time. A, a wow. beautiful coated bitch, you know what I mean. Maybe you could fault her here and there as an old dog, but this one had a spectacular coat, like my father used to call it her crowning glory. So the uh, Shalala kennel name is well was also your father's then. So you yes, just... it was. It's a okay. family prefix. Yeah. All right. Funny thing about that, we remember <clears throat> at the time. We got quite a good price for the, the my father did for this uh, Kerry Blue Bitch going to America at the time. I think it went to a priest actually in America. Anyway, that's that's irrelevant. But I remember in the small house we were in in Dublin, and um, the excitement of the uh, the Aer Lingus and the Aer, the Aer Carrier that van. In those days, it was very difficult to export a dog. The van actually their van came to our house, and we were all crying with the dog. And she went in the carrier box with the the stars and stripes and the tricolor on the box and we were all crying my father wasn't crying because he had the box in his back pocket but <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we, we were all crying when she went out and the proceeds of that we got the first television on our road oh. the first family to have a television on our own and if you remember you're probably not old enough but if you remember back those days mostly what you watched on television was snowstorms <laughs> even though there was no snow it was just all the snowstorms and in yeah. between you got a glimpse of a thing but uh, yeah I, we grew in up from there and you were always expected uh, it was a family occasion if there was a small show my mother and some of the team would have to make lunches and teas for everyone to exhibit and uh, for the exhibit and judges. Uh, it was the smaller shows were a training ground for judges. They would give them an opportunity to handle and examine dogs and, and be mentored by the older guys that were around. And me as a kind of a bottom a, a, a bottom feeder at that time, for want of a better word, I would be doing maybe the car park, collecting the money at the car park or setting up the rings or cleaning up the venue and so on. And uh, gradually you get into it and it becomes a part of your lifestyle. And that's really what it became with me. I then that's interesting. We spoke so about that my earlier. Own dog. Sorry, 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 sorry. We spoke about that a bit, a bit earlier because we were talking about the new generation. How they, our our clubs have become somewhat senior members now because the new generation doesn't want to do the things you just talked about. <laughs> Well, that's the point. They, they want to go straight in, straight to the top without any kind of form of basic. They think they've checked it out on, on Google and <laughs> uh, they know everything already. They know exactly what's to be done and they know how to do it. And they've looked at courses on Internet and they've seen, you know, they can get a course. What is the ideal how to judge a Kerry Blue? They can get as many as them as like from the minions to uh, anyone to homer simpson it doesn't matter you can get any advice on all of these things so they're they are ready they are finished they just want let me in give the yeah. no no background with me okay. and to explain it and you will know this i know by your attitude you're similar to me <clears throat> i was at the time where you came in and you showed a dog <clears throat> and i passed this information on to my son ross who's also got involved in this that sometimes you win and i'd say to him you see this dog you have ross that man over there, see him, is not as good a dog as yours. Your dog is a better dog, but he's going to win. Now I'm going to tell you why he's going to win. He's going to win because he's been all his life bringing something to this game. He has bred dogs over the years, and unless your dog is spectacularly better than him, he's going to win. And there'll come a time where you're going up to the grades as you gradually got up, and you will be at that level too. And then you will understand it. But you must understand it. It's not crooked. It's just, it's kind of a, a tipping the hat to the man's commitment and involvement and what he brought to the game over the years. And that deserves respect as well. So it's not as if that you, just because you have the greatest dog in the world, you will not always win. And it's not always a fix. It's sometimes for a very genuine and proper reason. 
So that's sure. a little bit unusual attitude, maybe. But there you go. But that's a respect <laughs> level that I think is lacking. You know, so I I, I follow you easily. Yeah, so, yeah we did. and then uh, we gradually started in. Uh, I got married. My wife, uh, they hadn't got show dogs, but they had a pet cocker. Uh, but uh, she. Luckily for me, uh, she caught the bug as well, the, the whole thing. I actually got her a different breed because I thought, again, my father got what he deserved. <laughs> my mother, me, my brother, my sister, she was way down the pecking order. So I think I thought at the time if she was coming to Kerry Blues and show Kerry Blues in the small little community we have in Ireland, she would be so far down the line that she'd probably lose interest. So um, I, I actually got her a wire fox terrier, oh. and um, he he was spectacular a winner for her, incredible winner. And she became very good actually the presentation and the, the stripping back the hand stripping of the dog so it was a great journey for her and it helped her establish her in her own right but she was the one okay eventually she came back to the Kerry blues because i think those who have Kerry blues will tell you they're a breed that holds your heart and uh, if you have them for a while uh, you, you'll just always come back to them there's something well i find something mystical about them i suppose uh, everyone <laughs> will say the same about their breed but anyway for <laughs> me the Kerry blues uno, no, no, numo uno. yeah and your country has produced some beautiful Kerry blue terriers oh my god yes. When I went so over there. You develop into that, Will, and you become, you start, first of all, this is what happened to me anyway, and I think it's the same generally. You start to kind of breed dogs, exhibit dogs, and you get a reputation for having uh, some decent dogs, and you gradually you are winning here and there, and then you breed some, and they say, oh, what a nice, seems to know what he's doing. We give him a chance at a lower level to judge. This is the way it was then. There was no courses or all of that stuff. It was just the people had to ask you. They looked at you and thought, maybe we'll give him a tryout and then you'd get the smaller shows where there was all breeds like not just very rarely did you get the opportunity to judge just your own breed usually you were thrown in at the deep end with all breeds simple as that at the small shows where they entered on the day and you would have um, big old fat women with attitude with chihuahuas you know and telling yeah. you that no he has two balls while they'd be holding on to the back making sure you didn't see all right to the <clears throat> to the aggressive terrier man saying now don't make a fool of yourself son this fellow's a big winner you know you know this routine so. <laughs> and the big the biggest test of all was to uh <laughs> for to get the newcomer to exist Examine the bite of a 14 months old bull terrier, any oh. 14 months old bird, because they are impossible. You yeah. know how giddy they are. They jump around, pulling their head. And this used to be hilarious watching the younger guys trying to get yeah, no, It's very important that you check them and check back here and they'd be wrestling around the floor. But th this is the way we kind of came along that way. Got the opportunity to go to UK uh, to judge some bigger numbers over there, which was great for us, and uh, became quite well known in the breed for our, for the, all the right reasons. <laughs> thank God. So yeah, that that became a big, and it was a gradual growth thing. And then eventually they asked you to do your own breed, Green Star. And then you develop people like what you do, and so on. And my reputation kept that way. Mm -hmm. At the same time, then I was always involved in administration because my family were. They always ran breed clubs. They always always ran training classes, all of those things. So it was natural that uh, we see it as giving something back. I mean, you, you, if you get into administration and give something back, if you've got a lifestyle that you like out of it and you're taking something there, I think you should give something back. So that's, that was my motivation to, to give something back, getting in, back into administration. So did, when, when did you first get into the, the political side of the kennel club? I suppose that's a good, good to pick a year on that. I was 21 years president. Oh, wow. Before yeah, that, I I that. Was, 21 years. Wow. Yeah, I was um, the chair of the the board of directors, which is used to be the general purposes committee, but because of financial status that we adjusted the club to, it ended up being called the board of directors. I think that was, in my opinion, I think that was possibly a mistake because it gave a, um, 
judicial responsibilities, which wouldn't necessarily coincide with your canine responsibilities. So I, I think they should have divorced the two, a general committee and the board of directors, you know, two separate. But, but anyway, they didn't. They let it run that way. So uh, I was chair of that for, uh, I can't remember, maybe about five, six years. And before that, a member of the general committee board of directors. I've also chaired the judges committee because ours is kind of a progression thing. You're expected to kind of turn up and help out at the shows, gradually get on one of the organizing committees and start off. And it's seen, it's not necessarily, but it's seen that you would go maybe for the field trial committee, working obedience and agility, or the judges education. Education committee, any of those three, right? And that would be a stepping stone to develop your your, your skills as an administrator and uh, procedures and, and a little bit of experience for you. And then gradually up onto the general committee, the board of directors, and then possibly one of, of the officers. And it was just a natural progression, uh, learning on the job, learning right along the line. Well, so when did you become president? We were 20, 21 years president, so... Yeah, well, let, let's get the calculator out. <laughs> <laughs> 21 years back. I leave that up to you. you said, right, uh, you're younger than me. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, well, it's 2023, so it's not too hard to figure out, I guess. <laughs> yeah. No, it was, a, a, to be honest with you, I was, I was very happy to, to get the opportunity to, uh, to, to be president and to have some role in developing in the organization because the organization was 100 years old last year. And I was a really, I studied well the formation of it, the personalities involved, the sacrifices they made over the years. And I had a great respect for the organization and those who formed it, that it could last 100 years and develop and grow. And I was keen to, to make sure that the sacrifices and the commitment that they had wasn't going to be wasted. So from my point of view, I said, it's your turn. It's your, you have I've got the wheel now. Let make a difference in as much as you can, and, and develop it as much as you can. And I, I was fortunate enough to be able to to achieve, you know, a fair amount, and to bring the Canada up to a really high level internationally and nationally with our politicians and that, and also marry in the health and welfare with the show dogs, which is a very uh, you know topical thing and very uh, needs delicate uh, handling and pro so I was very keen that that be presented right and that the uh, pedigree dog breeders are seen as uh, part of the solution and not the problem as what's been presented. So I thought uh, I developed a lot of uh, connections with veterinary organizations, government departments, and, and welfare, statutory welfare, not the uh, you know the casual ones, but the statutory animal welfare bodies. Developed a lot of close links with them so we could give the politicians a little bit of a, a clear direction, a, a joint direction to go in to help them in, you know, in bringing legislation and in their attitude going forward. It doesn't always work, but um, I, I thought that was the best way. Communication with these kind of like-minded bodies, uh, present the kennel in the way I think it should be presented, and, and, and you will achieve things. That was my way. We have um, your breed, your 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 national cultural breeds over there. The, the I want to talk about how you, you see them in the world now. How you see our setters, red and white, none of them all. Wheatons, carry blues, Irish tears. I, I know over there it's very important that you keep them um, like a breed preservation almost over there. Uh, and, and how do you see it worldwide? I think, first of all, are we pleased that, that the world sees qualities and recognizes things in the breeds of Irish origin and wants to be involved and wants to have them? Absolutely. We're delighted to share this with the world. We see this where this is a badge of pride that we have produced uh, these, well, eight breeds internationally with nine, but eight breeds internationally uh, that, that people want and admire and see qualities in, whether it's the working gun dog or the hounds or the terriers. So they see the beauty and the thing and they bring something to that patchwork which is kind of the pedigree dogs worldwide so we're delighted with that now with that comes a risk when things become popular uh, as we see with breeds various breeds over the years this can happen at kennel club level as well and breeders level sometimes the dogs become popular a breed becomes popular or 
it's in a genre where whoever has them, and this might particularly come into mind with handlers, they're considering the group. So uh, the breed is kind of, they figure, okay, we'd be okay in the breed because maybe there's not that many and we can travel the shows. But so we want to get a dog that's going to gonna win the group or is going to get it positioned or in, in the group because for the obvious reasons. And that, in my opinion, can result in um, some little leveling out of the breed standard uh, exaggerated movement, um, standing still like a statue, all of these things are required because this is what's going to happen. Because me, the geriatric old judge, is going to come in and you want him to think that your dog is really a great mover because he's going around like a wind hound, right? You, you, <laughs> he's, he's so hard to focus, you know, you have to have the dog exactly right, standing foot perfect, head on tail, right, at the time when this guy, this old duffer here from Ireland looks at him. So this is really, uh, and this can change. People can change a breed. I think the ones that you, if you think the concept between Lakeland Terriers, Welsh Terriers, Wire Fox Terriers, all of that little group there, they are different breeds and when you look at them with different characteristics. But realistically, right, realistically for the group, you're looking for a wire fox terrier with a different uh, coat or slightly heavier or whatever. But the, it's like the basic shape and all that you're looking for is that. Whereas if you go into the breed, sometimes a little stronger, the wedge a little stronger, the legs and a little squarer and you just clean it up. But the exaggerations sometimes, uh, they're the ones that catch people's eye extra. I, I think sure. what do the Victorians, the Victorians used to say that neck like a swan and a well-turned ankle. They, that was to describe women in the Victorian time. Well, now, you could apply that to dogs because they all want an extra neck. Yeah. And they all want an over-exaggerated at the hindquarters as well. So, neck like a swan, well-turned ankle. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe yeah. they knew something that we didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Well, I was I was over there. Um, yeah, sorry to, to follow on with your point, and yeah. unfortunately, as you see, I digress a lot. I like I it. Think <laughs> Joe Biden has been doing that over here for the last week. By the way, <laughs> <laughs> they can't they couldn't keep him to his time scale. <laughs> Every time they had the slot in, he got talking to Michael D. Higgins or to one of our prime politicians here, and it went on and on, and he would talk. So there was mayhem with the, the time schedule. I'm sure his security team were going mad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I would say it's funny because my my breed is actually, I, I grew up with Irish setters. So when I was over there, I was over there probably, I think, early 2000s with Wayne Kavanaugh and Mark Thruffell. And oh, yeah. we, we were at a show. And the Irish centers I watched, they were beautiful. They were, they, and there was, obviously, like every other dog show, this, the, the quality is varied. But there was dogs over there that I thought could win anywhere. So it was beautiful to see. Yeah, there, there, we have some really... Really nice and, and good breeders of um, of Irish setters <laughs> and UK or USA. You guys have as well, but unfortunately, you guys have let them go up and up in height, uh, and they're quite quite tall and strong, and a little bit over. Listen, we're back to the well turned ankle, yeah, uh, yeah. the big swooping Afghan kind of type of thing, and exaggerated uh, things that are eye attractive to the eye and very visual in the ring. But I think with when the dogs go bigger like that i don't know why don't ask me why i'm not a geneticist but i think their coats get duller for some reason or another i don't know why but the coats seem to get a bit dry and duller whereas the the smaller well what i would call the standard size the correct size those coats usually stay a bit deeper and a bit richer so the key elements is establishing type uh, you can get anything like you can get a sound mongrel so i i wouldn't be sure. if i'm establishing type i'm not going to go over the top on movement and, and as a judge said, wow, that's great. He's, he's very bad in the front. I just throw him out. You know, I, I'd more balance it. I'd say, has he got key elements of the breed? Like you mentioned the red setter. Well, there's a couple of things. I mean, it's the parallels in the head for a start. That's important. The little kind of raise in the eyebrows. That soft expression. 
that melting expression that that no i don't think any other breed has that that time when they look they catch your eye and that walnut kind of shape and the eye looking into you and then the gloss the, the rich deep gloss on the coat these are key key elements that kind of establish type and i think they make them what they are also as as a working dog they're a very good working dog yeah you, we have been um, lucky, and you're talking about the Irish breeds. Um, Kathy, my wife, and I, we've been involved in the Irish Breed Society, which the name speaks for itself, right. which deals with all the breeds of Irish origin. And uh, so we've had reason to interact with all of those breeds. So I'm not just a, a terrier man as such. And we also have a field trials section in our club. So we run field trials on the Bog of Allen in the centre of Ireland on, on a regular basis. Uh, and uh, we get the opportunity to see them working as well. Well, yeah, very interesting. We did we did a heritage thing there where we like gave a, a, an 18th or a 19th century experience where we had the setters, the red setters and the red and white setters, uh, with the working under hawks. Or sorry, yeah, under hawks. We had the hawks, trained hawks, and guys on a Connemara pony in, in costume, right? So we had this, and we get the hawks fly up, the dogs go out to rise the birds, and then the hawk come down. Okay, the hawks weren't really that well trained. So I think we had two two successes for the whole day where the hawk <laughs> actually got the bird. But uh, it was still an interesting, you know, thing to give you a feel what the dogs yeah. were bred for, exactly. how they work the field. Oh, that was, was really interesting, that was. One of the newer breeds to to uh, be accepted over here has been the Glen of a Mall Terror. Um, how do you feel it's progressing throughout the world? I mean, the, the Glen is... is um, He's, he's a very, very clear, very distinct, different dog, really, from a lot of what. And I think people are attracted to him. Some people are just attracted to that well, type of characters. Tough, just a characters. Tough little, a tough little dog with a strong, yeah. with practically the head of, like a wolfhound with no legs or something, you know. And some people think it when they look like that who don't have concept. Of but they, uh, listen, I... I believe that it's the the combination of strength, right, and personality and characteristics and agility, you know. But strength, heaviness, bone, substance. Now, these are key elements of, of, of that breed. And you will get a bit of diversion. And I think people are inclined to misinterpret the front on them and the top line on them and all of that. Like, think of confirmation and strength and ability to do the work that, that, that it's at. They have to stick with that. And I would say that that we're very conscious of the breeds of Irish origin in Ireland and the standards we produce. And we would like to think that uh, kennel clubs and exhibitors, for that matter, worldwide, would come back to us uh, all regularly and discuss with us, you know, where if they figure there's something going on in the breed or something that's not right, uh, and come back to us as the country of origin. And we can talk to them and adjust to them. Maybe if we feel like it's something localised, there might be a problem that could be localised in maybe uh, Norway or whatever, or Canada or Finland or Uruguay or whatever, that if it was a local problem we could even maybe help internationally and contact people and try and get new bloodlines or things like that mm -hmm. but uh, I think people are inclined to over uh, analyze breeds at this stage uh, academics come into uh, and they they talk you know theories and projects and what will work and they always seem to have an instant, instant solution for everything and it usually means crossbreeding uh, going outside and breeding something else which I can tell you is very very that brings its own real problems and I think if you if you establish that you have a breed first of all and we have to assume that there was a breed and that the standard was a description of the perfect specimen of that breed and so that we have all that there is no reason why you can't breed internally within the breed to correct anything that happens. There should be no reason. It, or if you think otherwise, there was never a breed in the first place. Right. So it's a matter of using the right uh, dogs and, and having the right programs together. But the idea of willy-nilly just because, oh, I think we should... Uh, put, look, we had this thing with the wolfhound. Would you believe that uh, people in uh, Holland, some people had made a thing to put the Alaskan Malamute as a crossbreeding, out crossbreeding with the Irish wolfhound? 
Can you imagine that? No. The solitary kind of, the, the solitary uh, Alaskan Malamute, you know, a strong, tough, independent dog with the size and the massive size of the wolf on it. Put them together and you get, you. it's not, it's not like mixing paint. You know, you're not going to put yellow and red together and get orange. Like, you can get anything. So that's the trouble with crossbreeding. So I, I'd be very, very, you know, reluctant to, to do that. I think if the breed and there's enough around and you can share internationally uh, semen and things like that, you should be able to correct and keep it right if you think there is a problem. And certainly come back to the come back to the home country. We have we have the national heritage for them now, as you probably know, we probably talk about that later on. But we have that. And that means the government has said, you know, these are something significant and specific to Ireland and its heritage. And we have the opportunity if there is a, a national or an international problem in any of our breeds, we can go to the government and say, listen, you, you have, you know, you've promised here, you've given a status. Now it's up to you to come across and help us with a problem that we're having in it. So I think if there is a problem or a perceived problem anywhere in the world with any of the Irish breeds for that matter, I think they should come back to, to the, the Irish Kennel Club and to the Irish Breed Society and the breed clubs in Ireland and see what we can do. And, and let's let's kind of cooperate and thing rather than just everybody having their instant solution. Because if you do that, once you allow that, it can happen anywhere. Anyway. Oh, exactly. Well, I, I forget it. it. it, it it's so confusing. Yeah. So I, I think that's the whole point. Just cheap level. Do you does the does the national does the club over there get a lot of inquiry from other country clubs? They, about their rules? The, the trouble is, as you know, now, now I'm not going to be naive because I'm all my life in this game. There is always a red team and a blue team. Always. Mm -hmm. And you get that. And sometimes they can equally have nice dogs. It's not a question that one has kind of bad dogs and one right. has good dogs. But you get that, and it's usually personality driven. I have to say this. It usually is control, a, a need to control, or personality driven. And that's not good for any breed. I can tell you that because this is why, and this is an offside. Don't, you'll have to excuse me. I keep that's running right. in and out of things. But this is why the Russian dogs became so good, so really good over the last kind of 20 years. They were had nothing really. About 30 years ago, the Russian dogs were very limited, very ordinary. But suddenly over that, and the reason why they did, first of all, they had money. Okay, that's a good start. Always <laughs> helps, yeah. But then they had the thing, if they saw you, Will, right, has a red setter, really good, and Sean Delmar has a red setter, really, two different kennel lines, right? But we hate each other. You're red and I'm blue and I don't. And we, we won't cooperate. You never use one of my dogs. I would never buy a pup for you. But the Russians would, please, Mr. Biggins, they would buy a bitch off you and a dog off me. And this replies to any breeds they've done. And that's what happened. They developed a line of some great dogs in a lot of, lot of breeds because they hadn't got the political uh, kind of heave-ho that we were stuck with. They were coming with a blank canvas and money, of course. But uh, that's and that sorry. is true because if you look at the, over the years, the breeds that they're into, they have really gotten strong, really yeah. gotten strong. And it's a, it's a money hobby in Russia as well. You know what I mean? It, it generates a lot of money over there. It's seen as kind of a sexy uh, hobby and generates uh, money to uh, some. Yeah, we're in a sexy hobby. How about that? Oh, yeah, of course, you're in a sexy breed. Look at me, what more do you want? Yeah. Nobody loves like an Irishman. <laughs> so, can you tell me more about this the national cultural heritage? Yeah, we we um we felt the Irish Breed Society, my, particularly Cathy and myself. Uh, and some other people in wolfhounds and other breeds and glands are all of them right that do you know what this is depending on one or two individuals as you quite rightly said the profile of your people over there is getting older and older and we're thinking that the breed clubs even very hard to generate new people into it and even so the numbers are so small that um it depended on one or two individuals. And if those two individuals are gone or haven't got the money to develop a program or lose interest or have a tragedy in their thing, that theoretically the breed could actually get into a very bad state with nobody to save it. Now, the breed clubs are supposed to help as well, and you would imagine that would be a, a, an administrative layer that could help. But reality is, as you said again, 
all the breed clubs were stuck with only a few people of an older generation and, and there's nobody new coming into it. So we felt as an extra layer of protection that um, some kind of government status to, to protect them w- would be worth going after. So that's what we did. We started a campaign to apply to the Heritage Department in the Irish government to explain the position in Irish history of the nine Irish breeds, right? Um, we tied them into political uh, characters, which a lot of them were true, uh, and also into the culture and the heritage over the centuries. So we were able to give a nice picture of where the, these nine breeds sat in, in the place in Irish history, their development and how they came and what they meant to the people at the time and how significant and important they were. And after three years annoying them, really, day and night, because they really didn't know where the heritage and an animal, they didn't know, they couldn't get their head around that. So, but anyway, eventually we, we, we got to the, that stage where they accepted that. So they have accepted that they, uh, that these nine Irish breeds are now have got a status and what they call intangible heritage status. That's intangible because you, it's not really the Leaning Tower of Pizza or the, the Matterhorn or the Golden Bridge. It's not mm. a, so. That's why they had to put the intangible as far as the culture. So we're 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 very happy with that because uh, the stories behind each of the Irish breeds. Some of them are very factual how they developed. Uh, some of them are a little bit now inventive uh, or filling gaps in. If you know what I mean, yeah, like yeah. so. But uh, we, we managed to Creative. do that. Yeah, exactly. But the Dan of Amal is an interesting one because. Uh, they were probably the time of uh, Queen Elizabeth when they were chasing down into the glens, trying to catch a guy who was on the run. This is back in the 1800s. And, um, of course, these guys, the, ar- the, the British uh, soldiers at that time were heavy armoured, big, you know, I mean, know when you're conquered, boom, boom. Imagine going into the mountains trying to catch guys like that, whereas the locals would come down small little daggers and knives, jump out of it, boom, boom, boom gone out again and the guys would be so they could she couldn't get soldiers so she got uh, hessian mercenaries from france and germany to come in to ireland and they were kind of came in with the lower basset hound type dog low slung scenting hounds uh, to go to track these guys up in the mountains uh, and this is it's thought that probably at the time they kind of crossbred with local terriers and this is why you have the massiveness and, and still the terrier attitude and, and like that's where it fit into our culture it was significant to the people at the time and it reflects what was going on and what happened in those 1800s back in the day the same way with the Kerry Blue as part of our independence. Michael Collins uh, had Kerry Blues and the Irish Kennel Club was formed the same year as the Dublin Irish Blue Terrier Club. And all the members of it were all kind of involved in the rising against the British at the time. All of them, including Michael Collins, who had, uh, you probably know this year, anybody with Kerry Blues will know this. Uh, he had dogs and Kerry Blues shown, even when he was on the run, supposed to be on the run, he was showing his Kerry Blues, you know. So the, 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 these type of things, uh, the wolf found Coo Cullen and, and all of his stories and, and the, the red setters where at one stage the king of France said only he, only the king could own a red and white setter, a red and white uh, uh, retrieving dog. Only the king, they weren't named that, but it was actually the red setters and red and white setters because the flight of the earls that went from Ireland during that time, they brought with them uh, dogs uh, to France and to Italy and Spain. And even your guys, we have uh, the, what do you call it, the Financial Services Centre down in the centre of Dublin City and the port. Uh, it's a very modern place and half of the money in Europe is goes through there. So it's, it's very significant. But we have a nice sculpture. It's of a family getting ready to board uh, uh, one of the boats for to go to America during the famine here in Ireland in the 1840s. And in it, they have the usual backpacks and a very emotive um, image, actually. I'll send you a copy of that. on. Yeah, for sure. And in it, there's a dog which is so like the Kerry Beagle that we have the Kerry Beagle here in Ireland now. And we have no doubt that uh, these dogs, Irish Terriers definitely, because they were the best ratters you could get. Uh, and probably the hunting dogs, the Kerry Beagle type of dog, went on those ships with these people. And I think maybe your coon hound 
might be actually a, a lion bred back to Kerry Beagle. Describe the Kerry Beagle for me, because most people it wouldn't would, know. They, think of your coon hound. That's the easiest way. Very like your coon hound or fox hound in type, right? That they have the usual hound colours. And the more interesting one for those of your uh, listeners who want to, they can just cop in this. It's called the Scartine pack, and that's S C A R T E E N pack, and that's a pack going on for nearly three hundred years in Limerick, in the west yeah. of Ireland, in Clare. Spell that for me again, Sean. S C A R T E E N. Okay. Starting pack, and that's the, they still have to this day have that pack running, and it still runs. And you can, for those of you guys who come over and want to get the Irish experience, you, you can actually, I think, contact the Scartian Pack, and they will do a, a package for you where you can actually ride out with the pack. And they're all black and tans. They they only breed black and tans. They don't. Well, I have them. I have a portrait of a Kerry Beagle because I, I had a young man from. Uh, Ireland that worked for me for a year or so, and he brought me over this picture, and I and it's a very it's 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 still very beagle like and it's the tri colors, but the lines are a bit different. Um, yeah, I but, just if I can explain to you about the beagle, that this is nothing to do with the beagle breed. <laughs> it's it's comes from the word biog, and biog meaning uh, small. In the Irish language, biog means small. So that's B-E-A-G, that means small in Gaelic language. So this was actually, when they were talking about a hound, wolfhound is big hound, beagle, small hound, biog. So that's where he wow, came okay, to get beagle. That. So it's actually nothing to do with the beagle. But he has all the hound colours you, you would expect, that, that you would imagine. And we were, we would like to try and promote that internationally and get him recognised internationally. And uh, I was in the process of doing this, but we'll, we'll see where it goes now. That's but we'd like to think that it would be interesting. I think it would yeah. be. The Finnish hound in Finland also is a hunt hound, is very similar. And they have established that the Kerry Beagle is in their bloodlines as well. Because as you know, hunt packs, they swap a lot. They, they have a lot of cooperation, mm -hmm. the hunt packs have. I'm definitely going to Google this. That's interesting. I want to I wanna find that. You'll see some great team. images of the pack uh, uh, working and uh, coming through autumn. And it's, it's, it's very interesting. The Ryan family, uh, the, the same family, have been involved in this all the time. It's it's quite interesting, you know, very wow. interesting. That is cool. Uh, I want to change hats and I want to go back to your judging because you've, you've judged internationally everywhere. Um, and I, I want your I want you to give me advice on judging. How you see it. Okay. I think uh, I yeah. should see it. Right. My, my main... Listen, the, the first time two guys sat in a pub with two dogs under the table, right? And I said, my dog is better than yours. And you said, your dog is better than mine. And they said, do you know what? We'll get Johnny from the other pub down the road to pick which one is the best because he has a good dog himself. And that's how dog shows started, in my opinion. That's the ultimate, the, the basic yeah. of a dog show. I think that the the opportunity to judge takes gives you a lot of responsibility, first of all. I do think so. People put an awful effort, especially over our way. And I know the handlers, it's their livelihood and it's important to them. Uh, but over here, even at a smaller level, there's guys who put a lot of effort into family breeding. Uh, that, that their wife mightn't like it. The, the imported semen from America failed. That so many, they got up at three o'clock in the morning to get ready and then you come along and patronize them. The I don't think so. The so first thing I think that a judge should have is obviously knowledge. Canine knowledge. He should have canine knowledge. He or she should have canine knowledge. Now, in an ideal world, it would be breed specific, and it would be like you would be the terrier guy or the the red setter man, and I'd be the carry blue fella, and that would happen everywhere. But the reality is, you need more wide, and, and, and so we get the opportunity to judge breeds that we're not particularly uh, familiar with. Now, I think the basic thing is you should know construction. Anyone who's interested in judging should be anatomy. It's like engineering. You should know construction. So you, sh you don't have to be an engineer, but you have to study that and learn and take whatever you can afford to understand that. And um, secondly, uh, movement is another thing. How that uh, 
affects movement and the breed specific things the shape of the dog how that will affect his movement and so on. this is another thing you've so there's a lot of responsibility and, and training on a judge thing the main thing is realize that you are not god or you you do not have a divine thing because you get a judge's license right what really has established there is you're somebody with a bit of commitment and all around dog knowledge, right? Who gets the opportunity and will have the intelligence to interpret a standard up to a fairly professional high level. And that's really all we're doing. We're interpreting a standard in our opinion. Now, I don't get that precious. I realize I'm limited and, you know, sometimes I won't get the emphasis on a breed and the particular points that a breed specialist would get. And I would hold my hands up straight away and say that. Oh, yeah. I said, well, yeah, you're the specialist. I understand. But this is it's based on my knowledge. It's an honest opinion. It's about construction. And I've tried to interpret your breed points if I misinterpreted them. If maybe they're not written as clearly as they should be. Or maybe what says this is a no-no, you guys in the breed don't care about it at all, because this 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 can happen too. I've seen yeah, that so many right. times. So I think it's about it's about make sure you're ready. You have a lot of responsibility when you when you go into that ring, you have a lot of responsibility. There's a couple of things. The kennel club who gives you the authority, you have a responsibility to them not to mess them up, not for people to say an Irish judge is crap because Sean Denver makes a mess of something. You have a responsibility to the show organizers, they put personal effort in to get this whole thing together and to make it happen. You have the responsibility to the prevent the handlers and the owners and all. They put a lot of effort. Some of them it's their career, some of them it's their lifelong passion and hobby. So you have a responsibility there. And you've also responsibility to the dog. I, I hate the heavy handed judges. That's one thing that irritates me like mad. I think you should put a lot of time and effort into your approach to handle a dog as lightly as you possibly can. And your approach and handing of the dogs should be really well thought out and well in advance and as light-handed as possible. There's no autopsy, autopsies on a corpse, right? N none of that, right? So just be as light as you can, respect the dog. Why should this dog abandon himself to random strangers? Right. That's not natural. So be, be careful, be gentle with the dog. Come in, don't come in, don't cover his eyes. Let him feel in control. Let him see you coming to him. If, if you need to, if you think he's a little bit wary, talk to the exhibitor as if he's not there. and Just a little bit as if you're talking to the exhibitor. No, and just come in gentle, underneath or to the side. Don't come down, don't cover his eyes. And then when you're examining him, you know, do it lightly. If you, if you know your gig, if you have your qualifications, you'll know where the shoulder points are. you know where the last rib is to the, where the loin is. You can just touch the point of the hock. You can rub your hand down the side, along the inside. And the same with the things to the elbow. All of this stuff, texture, code, there is no need. If you're confident and you know what you're doing, you can examine a dog very fluently and very slowly in the same manner every dog. Same with... Be the same. The handlers will watch you and they know what to expect. They'll move around the dog. It'll make the thing seamless. So everyone should feel comfortable. That's your responsibility. And it is a big responsibility. And don't listen, you will make a mess. I guarantee you, you will. Some things will happen. It'll go wrong. You will, and I've often come back to my wife, Kathy, at half time when we're having lunch. And I said, do you know what? In that, that class... That middle class, I, I, I lost my way. I was so busy looking at the dogs and all this thing that I think I lost my way. I think if I if I went back in, I think I'd put the other dog up. I really do. And I would say that honestly, I, I would have no, I wouldn't feel, you know, oh, um, I have spoken. It's not like the Mandalorian, you know, this is the way I have spoken. Like, <laughs> <laughs> judging is not like that. <laughs> this is my way, okay. And sometimes it's not always right. But believe you me, I'm sincere. I'm genuine. I'm a dog man. I've done my best to interpret your standard. And that, that's my results. Uh, sorry if, it, if, if, if it's not the right one or if it doesn't suit you, but it's given honestly and would not, would, would, with some education yeah, and, well, it's such a subjective always be ready sport, to learn always that. be ready to learn and sometimes it's very different see this fci excellent very good good and the way they grade them on the continent and that, that that's i'm not a big fan of that because i think um 
doesn't mean excellent or very good doesn't mean very good in, in, in as you and I would know it. I remember Peter Green was judging in Ireland when we just had introduced this FCI uh, grading of excellent, very good, good. And he was putting up a Terry and he said, uh, very good, uh, very good. And they said, oh, so you're, you're, you're not giving him the green star. You're not giving him the CC. No, I am. He's a very good dog. But if he's a very good dog, you can't give him the green star. <laughs> so this, this went on. And Peter said, listen, hold on, hold on. I like the dog. I want to give him everything. You do the administration. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> Brilliant. I just saw so, Pete uh, two weeks ago in, Ed- in uh, Edison, New Jersey. Yeah. Um, How is cool. he? Oh, he's great. I love Peter. Yeah. He's one of my favorite people. My God. Great guy. But he's the epitome of all that approach and the light handedness and the respect for he 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 would be a good role model. Yeah. If yeah, if I was to, if somebody was to say to me, uh, go and watch some judge judging, I'd say, Go to go watch Peter Green. Why just see the hands? They'd hit the significant points, just lightly touch oh, very mannerly with the dog, mannerly with the exhibitor. That's the way it should be. Yeah. Some of them have this God complex, you know. I can't I hate that. You know, they get a dicky bow or kind of a fancy brace you know and they're going <laughs> around with their hand in the air and rushing over and all of this it's all it's a performance you know god i i, I really i hate that, that all that over the top stuff you know i don't mind a little razzmatazz don't get me wrong it, it is an exhibition as well as a competition so a little bit of a drama is, is no problem but when it becomes the, the judge should be almost invisible up until the final decision right, right. Uh, but up to that, he should be practically invisible. But if if you're looking in a ring and all you see is this judge flouncing around with his dick coloured shirt, his dicky bow, drama and all thing, thing and moving and expressive and all of this, of it. what's they say over here? All fur coat and no knickers. <laughs> <laughs> I like that too. <laughs> <laughs> I like the part of the response, but I do feel that it's very you have such a huge responsibility judging to everyone, yeah. to the breeds, to the readers, to the handlers, to the, the clubs. Yeah, yeah, I really think that's a great point. Uh, I yeah. just started my judging career, so I really appreciate any advice. So yeah. And other thing, I they, they talk about um Right, written critiques. I don't think you do that much of it, except for breed speciality shows, probably over there. But in, in Scandinavia and in a lot of Europeans, they do critiques, uh, and it's written report for each dog that you do. And um, that that can be funny because newcomer judges they're trying to learn the standard off by heart, and then they're trying to apply that to the dog that they're judging. And their, their mind is so concentrating on remembering what way the shoulder should be and what the texture of the coat. And that they, they almost forget that the dog just becomes an object while right. they're trying to interpret the standard. And it becomes, I always, my advice to people doing reports like that is, okay, yes, you will study the standard. And yes, you will have it in that bank in the back of your head, right? But forget about the standard, right? What you're going to do is describe the dog in front of you. Simple. Like Judge Judy, if it walks like a duck, quacks like a duck, chances are it's a duck, right? Yeah. So describe what you say. If the head is heavy, say the head is heavy. Don't mind the standard. Do all describe the dog as you see him, put that into your report, and then when you're finished that, compare that in your mind to the standard and give him his grading and you won't go far wrong the others are trying to quote passages from the standard and it, that never works it really right. doesn't i i find that doesn't work so um yeah well that's great um so oh, sorry one other thing you're talking about things and judging and as you say i've had the great opportunity and the pleasure and the honor to judge a lot of places you're, you're always going to find um you get two dogs or three, and you really, you've no reason for it to put one over the other. You really haven't. And, and this is, yeah. <laughs> so I, I have two ways of doing that. So I, if I get two, and I'm not really sure, I just look and is one of them got a specific breed point? really good specific so one of them has say maybe really sharp ears and that's required in the breed standard i'll go for the one that has the, that little breed type thing now if they if i'm still lost and they're still i don't know where i'm going i just move them around the ring and whichever holds the shape best and takes the less amount the least amount of steps to get around the ring is the one i put up so that's my just 
that's in my head. So I'm yeah. not caught stuck in the ring, like with my mouth open. Oh, oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, I've know. seen that. You but know, that's what? the worst thing you can be. You know, that, that looks so, even though you're being genuine and, and you're trying, it just doesn't look good. It looks like you're indecisive. And, you yeah. Know. Well, it's funny because I was watching a, a good friend of mine was, and this is years ago now, he was judging a class of dogs and you could tell there was nothing that really struck him. And he ended up putting up a dog. And afterwards I asked him how he came to that conclusion. And he said, well, he didn't, he wasn't overly fond with, of any of them, but he said, if he had this choice of these four dogs to start breeding this breed, and he had to choose one to start this breed. That's the one he would have started with. He felt that one had the best chance of of bettering the breed. So that's a very very good approach. Yeah, that, I've that, always thought that's about a, that. a very good attitude, actually. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So what, what's next for Sean and Kathy? Are you, are you still actively breeding? Uh, we are. We um, we have our son. Our um, son Ross is still. We have three sons, but our son Ross is. He's still living here with us. Um, we keep trying to get rid of him, but we can't, you know. But, uh, <laughs> he won't he, watch he, this. He, won't he, has, he, has, he, has, he has some apartments in town, but he won't move out because, because he can't take his dogs. Anyway, <laughs> listen, don't get me wrong. Uh, from our point of view, it keeps us relevant. Yeah. It reminds us of the sacrifices that, that people go through to breed and to get a dog up to show level, to breed and to get one up to show level. And the, the, the passion and the commitment. It reminds us, in case we were forgetting, that he has the younger and the more enthusiastic attitude towards all this. Uh, like even when he was a young kid, people would have uh, all these famous film stars up on the wall. He had Rick Chisudia. That yeah, was the picture. I was like the same. Yeah, that was. That's, that's the that's picture. Great. He had well. oh, what's your son's name again? I'm sorry. Ross. R O S S. Ross. 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 Uh, some of your your fox terrier people will know him. They'll know him well. We have um, we're, we're kind of rolling back the years a little bit. We got uh, we've got a Kerry Blue now, a young Kerry Blue again, and we haven't had one now for a few years because our son was kind of going his own road. But we have a young dog now, a young Kerry Blue that we got from our good friend Ron Ramsey, in uh, the guy who owns Scarf Michael, who bred Scarf Michael. Uh, so we got a dog from him, and okay. we've known Ron before Scarf Michael even. Like he stayed in our house at Christmas time back in the day so he'd be one of our very close friends so we, we have we got a young dog from him just made his title up actually last weekend oh, so uh, uh, we're looking forward to he's kind of a, a community project we have well, a, make sure you of send three. Me a picture i'd love to see him yeah of course i will we've uh we've uh kathy uh ross and me and uh <laughs> He's like a committee. It's uh, everything requires a committee argument, and there's not one of us is a shrinking violet. So we all have opinions on everything, right? And so <laughs> anything that goes to our quality process <laughs> really has to go. <laughs> So he's one of these things. At the moment, I'm only logistics. I'm only allowed to drive the car, you know, bring the thing, maybe trim him up a little bit, you know, but it's Kathy and Ross are the ones. But he's a, he's, he's a dog that we really like personality-wise. I'm not going to start blowing his own trumpet about his quality, but uh, which is good. But uh, he's actually a really a great personality dog, a funny dog, um, peculiar little habits, uh, you know, all the things. It's a pleasure to have one of them. He's well, a dog that I can tell you, uh, he's never going to leave our kennels. I, 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 and yeah. very few of them I'd say that about because we're realistic. You know, you have to keep turning over and moving on, and yeah. especially if you get something, an opportunity for a dog to achieve somewhere else. But we can really say that we've all said that he's that type of a dog that he, no, he'll he'll die in these kennels. Oh, that's, I'm glad. I'm glad that you're back to carries. That's fabulous. Uh, yeah. I have one more question for you, Sean. If you were to meet the 20 year old Sean Delmar, is there any advice you'd give him now? <laughs> um, now there you go. Um, <laughs> I, I yeah, I would. Yeah, I tell you what, I would. I would tell him to stay with the Kerry Blues. And don't be fecking around. That's what I said. It's a breed that you were bred and born into, and you drifted out of it for what you thought were good reasons at the time. Where did you, you drift never, to? We never got into that. No, we, we went wire, our wire fox terriers, oh, okay, yeah. smooth fox terriers, sharp eye. Oh, I didn't know sharp eye. Yeah. <laughs> 
And, 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 a cocker. We, we, you know, we've dabbled in and out and all, but we should have really, and that's the one regret, that we didn't stay. It was there, it was in my blood, it was in my heritage, and I, the reason really wasn't it's about the dogs, it was about my political career in the dog, in the kennel club, and the amount of effort and time that I had to put into that. So the things that I achieved, like in the kennel club, they took priority, and I felt they were important, because sure. I, I respect the organisation. Like my, the, the chance that I was able to make the presentation that got us the European Winners Show into Dublin in 2009 and I made that presentation and it was great to get that and that brought something different, an international really flavour to Dublin, to the RDS in Dublin and, and that, that was great. I was delighted to be able to do that. So these are things, you know, joining the FCI was it was a big jump for us because we were kind of a little the kitchen area, the servants entrance for UK, you know what I mean? They really yeah. didn't really have much. Um, okay, certain breeds maybe, but generally we were known as the poor relations next door, and we were afraid that uh, being such a small organisation, they maybe could control our standards without. And I don't mean that in a nasty way, but right. but. So the FCI gave us that international authority and recognition that anything that the Irish Kennel Club did then would be, you know, agreed to by the FCI. Um, which meant it was kind of all over the world, which was great, you know. Well, you definitely sure. left your stamp with the Kennel Club. I didn't realize you weren't the president anymore. That's as much stamp as I remember. So I, I, yeah. I thought you've always yeah. been president as far as I know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Maybe well, you I really got the interview if you had a note. What's that? Maybe you wouldn't have done the interview if you hadn't have done that. <laughs> oh, I still would have done the interview. You're probably like, oh, shucks. <laughs> <laughs> but as you can see, I'm, I'm not really heartbroken because I can tell you, uh, uh, I still have the same respect for the organization and I still have the commitment to the whole thing and the breeds of Irish origin. So yeah. uh, I'm not a little bit, uh, not in the least bit down. And, and I'm I sure still you have, still have a lot, lot more. of input too. So. Yeah, there's a lot more to, to, to be got from me, you know. Yeah. I'm sure. I'm sure. Well, I really appreciate your time, Sean. It was great catching up. I haven't seen you in a while. And I, I, I just thank you for doing this for us. So it'll give us yeah. an insight into you. So Not at all, Will. It's nice to be able to get a chance. And I know you have a good listenership there. And, and I wish them all the best. And listen, my one advice to people, if you're not enjoying it, you shouldn't be doing it, really. That's right. So make, make sure you're enjoying it. And that's the right reason. Exactly. Well, thank you, Sean. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Will. Stay safe, everybody. Thank you, Sean. It was great catching up, and it was great hearing about all the national heritage. It was It's amazing. The stories were amazing. I just loved it. Um, if you like what you're seeing here, make sure you press the like, share, and subscribe button. If you want to get a hold of me, you can get a hold of me at, at willalexander.net. And don't forget about the podcast every Thursday with myself and Wayne Cavanaugh, the dog show drive. Everybody take care. Bye-bye now.